Welcome to today's IGC event, Policies and Innovations for Climate Resilient Farming in Developing Countries. I'm Jonathan Leap, Executive Director of the IGC, and I'm joining this event from Lusaka. Before we get started, let's review a few housekeeping items. All attendees have been muted to minify, minimize background noise. We're going to have a designated time at the end of the panel discussion to answer questions, so please type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Please make sure to include your full name and organizational affiliation. We are recording today's session and a video and audio recording will be made available on IGC's website. I'd also like to point out that there'll be a brief survey immediately following today's presentation. Please take a minute to fill that out later on as your feedback is very important to us. Please feel free to contribute to the conversation online by using Ag Innovation. Climate change is set to have a devastating impact on the developing world. Agricultural sectors dependent on weather and climatic conditions are particularly vulnerable. During, despite the commitments made during the COP26 summit in October, a world with more unpredictable and volatile weather systems is now unavoidable. This will have adverse impacts on agricultural production with implications for food security, poverty, and economic development. In the face of this, agricultural adaptation, the focus of this event, will be critically important to maintaining and supporting livelihoods and economic growth in the developing world. Alongside this event, we're launching a new growth brief today on this important topic, authored by IGC researcher Kelsey Jack and IGC policy economist Nick Wilkinson. Across low-income countries, agricultural sectors account for on average about two-thirds of the workforce and one-third of GDP. Because of their geographical location, these are the same countries that will experience the worst in natural disasters and increasingly harsh weather conditions. The prevalence of subsistence farming, food insecurity, and extreme poverty across the developing world make millions acutely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Without action, developmental gains are under threat. Alongside mitigation, adaptation to climate change is the twin component in reducing climate risk in the coming century. As emphasized in our forthcoming growth brief, adapting to higher variability in temperature and precipitation will be more challenging than adapting to increases in average temperatures. Agricultural production needs to become less sensitive to weather and climate shocks in order to minimize losses, maintain livelihoods, and build more resilience. However, the process of adaptation is unlikely to be cheap or easy. More accurate weather forecasts can help farmers make better investment decisions. Research in Africa and Asia found that greater access to accurate weather information can increase agricultural productivity. Weather-based insurance projects, products and more tailored loans can lower risk and support incomes and investment. Because agricultural sectors differ drastically across developing countries, it will be crucial for researchers to work with policymakers to generate more evidence to inform the appropriate design of interventions like insurance and credit in different contexts. I'll be putting a question to each of our speakers today before we move on to a general discussion and offer you, the uh, attendees, a chance to ask your questions. I'd like to welcome our panelists uh, here to tackle this interesting topic. The first speaker will be Kyle Emmerich, who's an Associate Professor of Economics at Tufts University. The second will be Vijaya Gupta, who is a Professor of Economics at the National Institute of Industrial Engineering in Mumbai. And the final speaker will be Asan Ngobe, who is Resilience Officer at the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA. Let me start uh, by asking a question of Kyle Emmerich. Agriculture is fun fundamentally reliant on the weather. Rain-fed agriculture is dominant in many parts of the developing world. Extreme events such as heat waves or cyclones can destroy crops. The weather thus dictates the income and profits that many farmers rely on. With climate change, this implies a greater amount of risk in agricultural production. Not only whether certain weather outcomes lead to a successful harvest or not, but also in the decisions farmers have to make before planting. 
Adaptation therefore needs to be thought of across the entire agricultural cycle and in response to this increased uncertainty. So Kyle, my question for you is, how will climate change affect the, the investment and production decisions made by farmers? Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. I uh, appreciate it. So by, by shifting the, the distribution of weather, uh, climate change makes events that used to be abnormal much closer to normal. Uh, so as we know, extreme hot years become more frequent uh, and smallholder farmers then have to re-optimize to this changing distribution. And so the goal, which as Jonathan uh, alluded to is for this re-optimization to keep farmers expected profits the same as they were before climate change. But we already have some evidence that exposure to, with, to, exposure to uh, weather risk, I should say, uh, changes the, the production decisions of farmers. So I'll give just a few examples and thoughts on that. So first, when facing uninsured risk, uh, farmers are naturally less willing to make investments early in the season that otherwise uh, might have been profitable. Uh, for example, knowing, knowing that the weather is, is more likely to turn out bad, an optimizing farmer may cultivate, say, a bit less land, or they may invest in fewer inputs. Um, or they may grow crops that are less profitable on average, but that are more tolerant to bad weather. And so the, the simple reality is that farmers face a trade-off um, and, and research has shown they can you know, invest more early on and, and potentially obtain a higher return, but this increases their exposure to bad weather. That's one thing um, that's key and we need to pay attention to is that by reducing, reducing incentives to invest early in the season, climate change lowers the return from, from farming. Um, and it does so even in years when the weather turns out fine. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it created this disincentive to invest um, in fields. Um, and so second, this kind of begs the question of whether climate smart practices, which are, you know, I, I think some of the other um, speakers will touch on, uh, can be adopted to decrease uh, the farmer's uh, exposure. This is an area where I think we really do need more evidence and more research. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that, that technologies or agricultural practices that only reduce a, a modest share of, of, of the farmer's overall exposure are probably not gonna be too transformative. Uh, for instance, a new seed that might only protect against a certain type of drought may reduce risk a little bit, uh, but not enough to be uh, transformative. Uh, and so in this space, you know, bundled interventions um, might be appropriate um, that, that really target different uh, types of risk that farmers face. And then the third, third and finally, um, climate change affects more than just decisions about how to manage plots. I mean, I come from this, you know, thinking about how farm level decisions are gonna be made, but the reality is that farm households in, in developing countries do a lot of stuff. Uh, and that is you know, part of their calculation at the beginning uh, and at the end of the season. And so we have empirical evidence showing that farmers often turn to, to non-farm work after negative weather events. Um, and the micro studies in this space show that these uh, effects can be quite, quite large, but what they might not capture, they might not reflect the, the possibility that the non-farm sector might not be strong enough in some contexts to absorb this extra employment uh, and particularly in the presence of aggregate shocks that, that, that the micro studies can't, can't, uh, can't do uh, as much with. Um, so we need to think about migration as another margin where farmers have been shown to adjust. But, but to be clear, welfare is not uh, simple in this case when we start thinking about labor reallocation um, on the margin. It may become optimal as climate changes for some farm households to exit agriculture uh, but that's no guarantee that their income stays the same or goes up. And even if it does, as some have found, uh, welfare uh, includes a lot more dimensions than that. Uh, so it's a very complex problem uh, to try and solve. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Kyle. I meant to mention that Kyle's joining us uh, from Boston. My next uh, question is, uh, Vijay, for you. Um, uh, uh, Vijay is joining us from Mumbai. And... Um, 
uh, I would like to ask uh, you about a, a further issue in adaptation. We know that it's going to be essential in the face of the growing climate risk and that it can take the form of behavioral changes and uh, the way uh, Kyle was talking about in response or even in anticipation uh, of uh, weather changes, uh, but it can also take uh, the form of uh, uh, the products or byproducts of technological change. So we can see adaptation is flowing from technological change as well. And both of these, both behavioral change and technological change can together feed into increased resilience or reduced sensitivity. Um, we also know that a lot of those actions are likely to be costly uh, and they're likely to be various impediments, whether they're information or other kinds of impediments. So I wonder if you could uh, talk to us uh, a bit about the types of barriers uh, that affect a farmer's ability to adapt, uh, to adopt the kinds of things, uh, you know, both technological or behavioral that, that might help them to respond to the risks that they face. Oh, you're on mute, Vijaya. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes. So thank you very much, Jonathan. I'm deeply honored to be invited on this platform. And uh, as you have rightly put, and Kyle also have mentioned that, uh, you know, farmers face uh, numerous challenges uh, while taking decisions to, you know, adapt or not to adapt. You have already set the tone uh, in, the, in the beginning itself. And uh, these decisions are actually influenced not only by their socioeconomic or demographic profile, uh, but at the same time, their perception of climate change and the variability. Over a period of time, we have seen across the world, indigenous people have been perceiving the change in the climate for ages. And accordingly, they are actually, you know, taking decisions on their farming practices. Uh, this is also confirmed in our study. I mean, we did this study micro, micro level assessment of more than 700 farmers and households in Bihar state of India. And we found that 80% of our sample farmers could perceive and predict the climate change and variability like changes in temperature or, or, or rainfall or experience uh, extreme events, Bihar is known for flooding. So, uh, but at the same time, these, uh, you know, these experiences, these, their perception may not be very accurate. So their decisions on adaptation depends on really weighing the perceived benefits of adaptation and, uh, and, and the risk of not adapting. So definitely they will be, be you know, weighing both of these two options. At the same time, uh, besides their perception, the choice of adaptation strategies improve with accurate and timely information if it is provided to them on climatic variability and precise technical details on adaptation strategies. Also, you know, in developing countries, there are a lot more challenges as, as we uh, have been facing in the farming community. In the absence of institutional support mechanism, which is, uh, which is improving although, in, in particularly in India, including knowledge transfer on agronomic practices through extension services, institutional credit uh, provisions, better price realization through market access. So, and better buy bargaining in both the markets, input market as well as the output market. Uh, and, and, and as Kyle mentioned, financial insurance uh, against their risk, they are already into risk of the climate change. So adaptation can be really, really, it is, I mean, in the absence of all these, adaptation is really challenging for them. Now, adaptation strategies could be, uh, you know, it could be at, maybe on the farm level, maybe like crop rotation or changing crop varieties, soil and water conservation, or secondly, it could be a livelihood diversification, maybe through migration, as Kyle mentioned, uh, or, or maybe uh, financial risk diversification, crop insurance, planting vegetables, these kind of uh, financial risk uh, diversification they may take. Farmers share their, their experience, they use social media and get information from each other, you know, and, and uh, different channels. So therefore, therefore, I feel that uh, in developing countries and in uh, less developing, developing countries, mobile network and the provision of media channels are also very crucial. Uh, therefore, adaptation decisions are, and at the same time, these deci decisions are further challenged by their ability to adapt which is influenced by their you know, uh, farm characteristics. Like they have farm size, which is quite small, you know, a soil 
condition may not be uh, as 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 good as possible as possible irrigation facilities may be missing market access as i have just discussed socio economic characteristics of the households as well that is it is ability to adapt meaning that their financial status it is not just the financial status we have also observed that if the farmer is younger in age and and farmer is actually uh, you know educated normally he is a fast tech learner and enthusiastic to adapt uh, knowledgeable intensive adaptation strategies due to faster understanding and acceptability so farm size and possession of better resources definitely improve their ability to adapt which is which is which is a challenge in itself in the in the developing countries the farmers decision to uh, adopt adaptation strategies are associated with the expected utility of you know from 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 a particular decision uh, which they are taking from a bundle of adaptation strategy they may be you know adapting partially or they may be ad adapting fully so it really depends on how much they are going to earn so they do some kind of cost benefit analysis for example the farmer will adopt water conservation strategies if he is aware that the expected utilities to adapt is greater than the utility derived in the case of no adaptation so uh, you know what i feel here is that in, in developing an underdeveloped world the farmers are facing lots and lots of challenges it is not just a perception perception is to an extent is 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 there but at the same time this perception is to be improved with 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 their you know with with the provision of accurate information on on climate so with the extension services at the same time you know their their, their financial capabilities also to be improved through market you know improving the market access to them Thank you very much, uh, Vijaya. Uh, Asan, let me uh, turn to you. Uh, Asan's joining us from Dodoma in Tanzania. Uh, we've talked about many different policies and interventions that could be adopted to support adaptation. Um, uh, of course, these do include, as I mentioned briefly before, new technologies such as flood tolerant rice varieties, better packaged and delivered weather information, uh, maybe weather indexed insurance products and so forth. I wonder if you could tell us sort of in practice what types of agricultural systems offer the most potential so what are the strategies and and products and interventions that in your experience offer the most um the most uh potential yeah thanks a lot jonathan and it's an honor to be part of this panel to discuss this really important uh, subject and um issues that affect people's lives um, just you know, just to 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 jump onto what uh, uh, Vijaya was saying that you know the problems that farmers are and people are facing are actually real, and if I may just you know uh, talk about some of the few things that we see on the ground, you know, um, we've seen a reduction in yields in a number of farmers for up to about thirty percent. That's what research shows. Uh, but having worked with farmers directly, sometimes we see total crop failures. These issues are real. I'm from Zambia, just like you know where you come from, where you are right now. And I was at home uh, over Christmas, and there was totally, absolutely no rain. Just when I left to come back to East Africa for work, it poured like crazy. And one of my friends, who is a farmer, lost his total crop, absolutely everything. So you can imagine what um, an increase in temperature of above 1.5 degrees is likely to, to, you know, to, 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 to mean on us in Africa. Um, issues of poverty are really key on our agenda. So within this framework, so what actually works um, from, the, from experience, from projects that we implement, from initiatives that us and our partners are, are working on, on the ground. Um, it's really difficult to say what actually works because Africa is so diverse with a lot of diverse systems. But what we typically see is projects that are offering our solutions to people's real need immediately. We have families and farming families that go without food um, for, for a number of months in a year. So offering solutions that provide them the ability to have food on their table increases their chance uh, for adaptation. So when you bring projects to them, they are able to implement them because they actually do have means of survival. So having projects that are relevant to people's needs across the different farming uh, systems across Africa is one thing that's really key. Another key, another key issue is projects that have multiple benefits. Um, typically, we find projects um, that focus on water, health, uh, improved varieties. Uh, these 
take time to be um, um, to be adopted by farmers unless these have multiple benefits. They provide jobs. They provide a way in which it preserves their environment for them to be able to um, to, to seek more adapt, uh, livelihood opportunities from um, their landscapes. So projects that typically have more um, um, benefits than one uh, tend to gain momentum on the ground and help farmers adapt to issues of climate change and environmental degradation. Another key issue is projects and initiatives that rely on resources that are within farming families accessibility. And in this, I'm talking about nature-based solutions. Uh, these are really key because they cost less, um, they rely on indigenous knowledge, um, and typically farmers, communities, uh, and, and, and you know, governments at a devolved level can relate to them. So being able to innovate around resources that farmers already use uh, is one big plus that we've seen um, in, in, in projects that we implement. I, I can give an example of one of the projects that we implemented in Kenya, western part of Kenya. Um, it's about sustainable land management, um, but it also works around um, building adaptation capacities for farmers and communities uh, because of the nature of the fact that there's reduced rain uh, and also encroachment on forests. Farmers re re recognize that the forests that are around them provide them more than just shade and water, but medicine, um, recreation, et cetera. And because of that, we are seeing more adoption. People are taking ownership of the projects on the ground. Um, let me just mention, as I conclude on this, a couple of key principles that um, we've been following to try and drive success around adaptation uh, is local ownership. I think this is nothing new to a lot of people. Um, it, it links very well to local resources. Um, issues of use of local knowledge, as just mentioned. Um, another key issue is the ability of these projects to influence the strength uh, of policies, but also the development of new policies to have systems that respond um, when shocks do occur. Uh, inclusivity has been another key issue, women and youth. Uh, we've noted that a lot of adaptation projects tend to attract a lot of the women and the youth tend to go to the cities. So having projects that create jobs within their vicinity is something that really works around adaptation. It's really hard, but I think that's, that's the reason we're here as development uh, experts is to solve some of these really hard, hard problems. Um, another key uh, principle is around developing projects that don't tend to solve everything, but take an incremental approach towards the gains that we're making. Trying to solve all problems tends to confuse us sometimes, and we end up doing a lot, but achieving little. So taking an incremental approach does work. Um, another key principle is working on projects that leverage um, other successes, particularly financing, which is so short within agriculture, uh, agriculture adaptation, adaptation in agriculture. Those tend to work really well, as long as we are working on partnership, leveraging what has worked um, and building and learning from um, others you know, not for us to go into making mistakes where others have. So it's a whole menu of things. And uh, like I said, there's no clear cut answer. And sometimes we do um, do a little bit of try and error. And that's how we thank people from the research community, people who have gone before us. So let me stop here for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Asan, And thanks, uh, thanks to all of you. Um, let me ask a couple of questions just to, to get us started of uh, the panel. Um, I think quite striking that all three of you talked uh, about adaptation above the level of the farm. So we often sort of look at the farm and whether we're talking about seeds or other sort of practices, changes in practices being part of the solution. But uh, Kyle, you mentioned uh, shifts to non-farm -farm work as an important element. And Vijaya, you talked about uh, livelihood diversification, not just uh, crop or other uh, diversification. And um, Asan, you were talking about uh, youth and, and the, this issue of, of migration as well. Could we stay at that level? And I just get each of your view on how important that will be. So both rural urban migration, possibly temporary, possibly not, possibly seasonal, possibly permanent. Um, but then other issues in terms of access to jobs, to non-firm work and so forth. And I just wonder if I could get your sense of both this, how important this will be as your, in your, your sense of how important this will be as, as part of adaptation and what the key features of that might be. 
uh, Vijaya, do you want to start us off and then yeah, so sure, sure. Both Kyle sure. and you know, Sam so, Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, in this uh, context, uh, as, as we have been uh, talking about the inefficiencies and low productivity in the agricultural sectors in developing countries, which are still persisting in, in you know, uh, in, in developing countries, uh, this is, you know, inefficiencies and the low productivity is uh, all relative. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time, developing countries are also improving in terms of productivity, but uh, impact of climate change is definitely being seen. And large population around 40 to 50 percent is still dependent on agriculture for their livelihood. Uh, though the livelihood dependency has fallen over a period of time sharply and so has the land use in agriculture. But still 85 percent of farmers operate on less than five acres of land in India and 60, 60 to 70 percent uh, our, our farming coming from dry land uh, and rain fed farms. Also, what is more challenging is that the per capita water ability, availability is falling very sharply with 25 to 30% of water utilized uh, highly inefficiently. So this is another challenge which, uh, which, is, uh, which is being faced that in, in these countries. Farmers earn uh, only part of their income from the farming activities. Uh, other, other incomes, they have to really add other income sources. Uh, like wages, uh, daily wage earners or off-farm activities, non-farm activities. But at the same time, there exists uh, inherent heterogeneity in employment opportunities and wage differentials between rural and the urban areas. And therefore, family actually, family members or one or two family members migrate due to full of economic opportunities as we have been talking about migration because of the climate change, which is becoming an issue. And due to push uh, for adaptation to climate change and poverty alleviation, a possible insurance mechanism and diversify their income. This is, you know, migration is becoming uh, a source of income uh, for them. And we have observed a silver lining in the migration here. So the migrating households, financial and knowledge remittances, they bring, in, they bring back their finances at the same time, they bring back the knowledge as well, which actually improve their adaptive capacity. The migrated uh, family members support the uh, family, not only financial, but at the same time, bringing back the benefits of understanding of newer technology, newer market, and, and understanding the market through, you know, through, through various channels. So our study has uh, also found that higher number of adaptation strategies used in combination increase the crop productivity and show the effectiveness of adaptation in potentially enhancing the livelihood along the local food security. So okay. I feel that, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me give, I want to give Kyle and Hassan a chance to comment too. Kyle. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with those things. I think one thing that is really useful to, to keep in mind is uh, distinguishing between um, ex ante, you know, leaving agriculture and migrating uh, as a permanent adaptation versus ex post when the crop you know, has a bad year um, looking for uh, non-farm uh, non work. And on the latter, I, I think that, you know, we found that people do do that, but there's some things to keep in mind uh, uh, with that. And one that I think, especially in the Indian context with I'm, which, with I'm, which, with I'm most familiar um, is gender. Um, and, you know, that those type of non-farm activities that uh, require leaving the village are just less accessible uh, for women who are just who are equally dependent on you know, agricultural labor, and so that as an adapt source of adaptation uh, can can lead to um, a gender inequity uh, that that we need to be uh, really really yeah. aware of. Um, and so you know it may be that it may be that the the male agricultural laborers can smooth their income by going and working in a coal mine you know uh, ten kilometers away. But that's not an accessible instrument for for you know uh, uh, marginal uh, female female uh, laborers, uh, small farmers, and so that's a really important thing to to keep in mind. Okay, very good. Thanks, uh, Kyle. Asan, any comments on this? The sort of diversification at the level of livelihoods and migration and those issues. Yes, I mean these are realities that we actually do see uh, currently happening. That people are moving. Um, from one place to the other, it's really difficult to, to do anything about it because people are, are struggling to survive. Um, but it's important for us to look at it from a systemic point of view. 
um, as we design adaptation initiatives, I think we need also to shift from the perspective of looking at it from an agriculture transformation to a food system transformation, because it drives the movement of people back and forth. And if we plan it in a way that people are able to um, adapt and transform their lives in a manner that's sustainable, uh, let's see those people who move to urban areas, you know, if we plan for them, we're able to maximize on resource efficiency and be able to create the balance. But ultimately, as Kyla said, we need to look at it from a system perspective and see the inequalities that are being, you know, uh, promoted through such adaptation uh, initiatives, I mean, adaptation responses, uh, and develop initiatives that are counter to that. Um, we need to promote um, alternative livelihoods based on skill and science, uh, uh, and, but some will have a natural progression. But in as far as we can, we need to use the science that's available to try and mitigate some of the negative effects of um, people's adaptation actions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Asan. Um, uh, Vijaya, you mentioned in, in your response just now about, you noted how uh, agriculture, uh, there are lots of existing inefficiencies and low productivity in agriculture across the developing world. And I wonder if we could focus on that a bit and, and uh, invite all of your comments about how does that affect the prospects for adaptation? Now, I think people have made a couple of comments already about, about that, but I want to focus on the sort of starting point that we are where we do have agricultural sectors, which are less efficient we know than the economy as a whole two-thirds of the workforce is in agriculture and only one-third of gdp comes from agriculture so we know that the starting point is that it, there is a lot of inefficiency and low productivity how does that uh, affect how we need to think about adaptation in terms of the prospects for that taking place efficiently yes uh, jonathan uh, as i've already discussed uh, that the challenges and the issues uh, the developing countries are facing enormous, they are enormous. And uh, these inefficiencies, uh, I, I give you the example of this pandemic time period when the migration and the reverse migration happened. And, uh, you know, the in spite of the reverse migra migration, when it happened, people reached to their villages, people, and, and there was availability of labor in the, in the villages, they could actually, uh, you know, uh, the, the total output was increased uh, much more than, than the previous years. The growth rate was much higher. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, increase in the output is not sufficient enough. What is going to be the value of this output as compared to the uh, output levels of, of, of other sectors, like services and the industry. So agricultural sector definitely not is, is not comparable at all with any other sector at the same time. Uh, you know, there is a, there is an angel effect, angel curve effect on the agricultural sector. So people are definitely not going to uh, consume more and more as as they they grow. So so this is another issue here is that the demand for agriculture produce is going to be limited only, and and as as we progress over a period of time, it is not limited in the sense that in comparison to other sectors, it is going to be limited. So uh, if you compare the inefficiencies vis vis in agriculture sector vis-a-vis -vis other sectors, definitely the inefficiencies are existing in this sector. And, but at the same time, over a period of time, uh, the, the, if you compare the efficiency over a period of time, this is in improving. Now, as you have rightly uh, pointed out on the efficiency, inefficiency part, so I think the uh, technological upgradation in the, in the sector uh, like uh, maybe use of uh, artificial intelligence, as I mentioned, that uh, 20, almost 25 to 30 percent of water is highly under uh, you know, inefficiently utilized. So, if uh, in case of irrigation or in case of uh, water usage, this newer technology comes into the play, like artificial intelligence or Internet of Things, big data analytics, remote sensing. So, uh, you know, these these inefficiencies can be reduced to to an extent. Okay, thanks. Kyle, can I come to you and I, I wonder, um, uh, but you can choose to answer the question in a different way, but you know, one question um, I have is, to what extent should policy be aimed at retaining as many uh, you know, uh, farmers in, their, in the sort of sector and the, in the rural areas, as opposed to supporting or at least um, uh, 
uh, allowing um, migration to the cities as part of the long run solution. Right? We know that in general, structural transformation involves that kind of migration. Uh, so I just wonder when we're thinking about adaptation, how do we put together that with the sort of immediate challenges? Yeah, I think that that is certainly part of uh, the picture. Um, at, at the same time, at the same time, interventions and things that drive agricultural productivity can can do both. I, I mean, a lot of a lot of you know sort of the economic models we have show that increasing agricultural productivity can make that that you know can cause the non-farm sector to thrive. Uh, locally, and that's going to create employment opportunities locally uh, for people. So, in some in some ways, it's not impossible to to do both of those things uh, simultaneously. But also, I think that the, like diversifying and in, incorporating non farm work and thinking about migration is critically part of the picture. And I, I again, I come from this from <laughs> often thinking about you know farm level decisions and farm level models and how can we solve those those problems but indeed it's much more uh, broad broad than that for instance um think if we think about migration uh, and labor reallocation as a potential source of adaptation for some it may not be the same for 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 all but for some there are market frictions that prevent that from happening uh land rights uh land rights being informal and um in, in some contexts make it hard to reallocate land and so a household who may be better off actually reallocating their labor elsewhere, um, has a hard time reallocating their land to another more productive household in, in the village and that hinders that type of adaptation. So it's really a, it's a market friction much higher up than just a, a little uh, constraint on farm level uh, you know, uh, adoption. Thanks, Carl. Asan. Any comments on this? Just you know, there's sort of, how does the fact the starting point where there is widespread inefficiency and low productivity in in agriculture? How does that affect both the sort of strategies for adaptation, the right strategies, but also the prospects? Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, these are not really easy answers, uh, easy questions to answer, and um, the inefficiencies that we have in agriculture are precisely what we we are working on to try and um, to sort out. And, and, and the kind of work counter to adaptation strategies um, for us. And then, then we pick out the issue of productivity gains uh, that we need to close. In Africa, the productivity gap can sometimes be as much as 60, 70%. And just increasing that by 30% in terms of product, product, productivity levels of farmers, we uh, sort out quite a big um, problem with regard to um, issues of, of adaptation. But when we have these inefficiencies embedded within our agriculture and farming systems, um, it becomes extremely difficult to add on layers of technologies that help improve adaptation. Uh, but that said, most of our clients, our governments really have no choice because these inbuilt inefficiencies tend to um, grow into bigger negative effects on the economy. For example, the import bill for um, food in Africa is huge. It's in the tens of billions of dollars every year. Um, if we're able to sort out inefficiency within the agriculture sector, reduces our import bill, maybe we can you know, um, move into more adaptation initiatives, building capacities of people, creating more jobs at the rural, infrastructure that is climate resilient, supporting markets that um, are able to absorb uh, the production that we are growing and hence building incomes and resilience of farmers. So the inherent inefficiencies we have in our farming systems make it really difficult for adaptation initiatives to take root because of the ripple effects it has across societies, across um, economies. Um, these are issues that are not, um, it's not impossible to deal with them, but they require leadership and focus because we have seen it happen. We've seen Rwanda make you know, changes around its investments and efficiencies in agriculture within, you know, relatively relative short periods of time. Ethiopia has shown that. The potentials are there. In Ghana is also, you know, really leading on, you know, um, productivity gains. So we can improve the inefficiencies uh, because we have no choice at this point, really. Thanks, Asan. 
One, one final question before we open up to questions from, from the attendees. Um, a bit of a self-interested question in the sense that the IGC is a center for economic research primarily. And I wonder if you could help us with our agenda. So how, what do you think, where do you think economic research can help us uh, most in identifying and evaluating uh, the right strategies for agricultural adaptation, whether those are sort of, you know, behavioral technological market, whatever. So where, where is research, uh, particularly economics research, most needed? Uh, Asan, could I come to you first? Yeah, um, <laughs> economic research. Um, we, we, we always kind of, as we develop projects, we try to look for the, you know, uh, leverage point to, to make our projects more impactful. And more and more, as we work with policymakers, we talk about how do we get ministries of finance onto the table for the adaptation agenda. And typically, most of our ministries of finance are looking at economic growth. So how do we pitch adaptation as an economic issue? I think there's huge ga gaps in there, scenarios that have not been tested or, uh, around Africa to develop evidence around that to actually demonstrate the cost of inaction, cost benefit. You know, if we don't adapt now, what does our economy look like in the next 10, 15 years, the next five years. Um, it's the same way in terms of how we develop capacities. How do we design our education policies, our uh, skills uh, policies for those that are just finishing uh, the education and going into skilled employment? We look at the economic benefit, but we don't have the hard evidence of say, um, uh, skilling uh, young people in farming um, skills vis-a-vis uh, -vis the economy. Uh, it's, it's like you said earlier, it's really inefficient uh, in terms of the contribution to GDP. And we need to find why that is so. Uh, so a, a lot of work that I think we, we can do, modeling um, the, the, the cost of adaptation from an economic growth perspective is one key area, uh, but also looking at the true cost of not doing it is something that I think our economists would really contribute to agriculture. Very good. Thank, thanks, Asan. Uh, Vijaya, what would you add to that yeah. uh, research agenda? Uh, as, as, as Asan uh, mentioned uh, about indigenous knowledge, uh, and I think there is a need to tap this, these agroclimatic differences, not only, uh, you know, they, these, these actually agroclimatic differences are providing challenges, but at the same time, they provide opportunities for innovation. And these are full of indigenous knowledge. Uh, there could be many unexploited indigenous vegetables, grains, which are consumed locally without being considered as a primary source of food and income in other parts. So these indigenous produce as well as the knowledge could hold great potential for the future challenge, uh, challenges of food and nutritional security and climate change. So uh, I think I, that, that uh, researches should be done on these indigenous communities, the, uh, how they survive on or rather, you know, maintain their food and nutritional securities and improve, improvise upon these knowledges. Uh, in UNESCO also, it has been considered as part of the climate science and policy. Uh, and, and, and what is more important that this is, these are to be marketed and, uh, you know, designed. The strategies are to be designed at the same time researches are to be done. Uh, more importantly, uh, the, you know, in India, actually, Government of India is uh, along with many of the NGOs like MS Swaminathan Foundation in, in Chennai, they are working on indigenous knowledge. At the same time, I feel that innovative and scientific methods of adaptation are to be well established. And to prove the same, one needs to uh, prove the feasibility and profitability of those, of the innovation in the farmer's field and beyond the laboratory. That is in kind of uncontrolled, uh, uh, you know, uh, situation so where all parameters are in the laboratory, all parameters are controlled once. So the complete economic review should be done at the micro level or the, or the farm level. Economic studies based on the micro assessment at the, at the local level should help us establish the feasibility and profitability. As Kyle mentioned, that economic modeling is to be done for the short and the long time period. Mm -hmm. And once these benefit, benefits are established at some locations, the general framework is ready. Those, uh, these uh, can be patented and marketed the startups of these methods should be given a hand holding, you know, not by the government, but also the business houses. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are definitely challenges, but research should be, should be in that direction. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Kyle. 
Yeah, I'll just quickly you know, give my two cents on you know, a few sort of what I think their research priorities. Um, and, and perhaps I'm a bit biased here, but you know, careful micro level, careful micro level studies that show what works as adaptation uh, are critical and, and continue to be important. Uh, those are not easy to do because some technologies which serve as climate adaptation may only deliver benefits one every three or four years or every five years. And so it takes a lot of time to study those in, in real farmers fields and actually have farmers realize or see a return and adjust their behavior and investments. So uh, often those are really you know, long-term studies, but careful micro level studies um, are critical. But also I think it's important to, to think about research that looks at you know, exactly the kind of market failures and bigger issues more, more upstream that, that uh, we've spoken about. Um, you know, for, for instance, water conservation is a, is a reasonable source of adaptation. Uh, you know, one century from now, it's gonna be nice if there's groundwater in the aquifer to draw on when the rain is, is not good, um, but you kind of need to conserve that resource uh, for that to be possible. Um, but in reality, a lot of farmers don't pay for the water they use, they pay some fixed per acre fee. And so the incentives that are in place to actually conserve as a source of adaptation are just not there. And so it's really something that's more upstream. So research that understands those, I think is the second thing. And then lastly, I'll just say that uh, I really like the idea of sort of combining both, both micro studies and then uh, let me put in a plug for the more macro studies too, because I think those are really, important and then can capture things that, that, that the micro studies uh, cannot. Climate change is a, is a macro phenomenon. <laughs> and so it's going to affect markets, it's going to uh, affect multiple sectors at a time. And so some of the, some of the models uh, that, that, that are more macro uh, can capture some of those things where the purely applied micro research uh, cannot. So I think there's a lot of complementarities here. Right. Thanks very uh, much. Yes, sorry, sure. Can I just add one more point there on uh, what type of research you could probably do? Um, the issue of the political economy is also really important. I know, you know, economic incentives are really key to get adoptions and innovation, but I think more often we ignore the political economy of, of, of the adoption. And, um, you know, what happens on the ground sometimes can be really different from economic rules. So it'd be really worth looking at what other incentives in addition to economic incentives would make adaptation work in, 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 in agriculture and food systems. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thanks very much, Hassan. Let's open it now to questions uh, from those uh, attending today. And I have the first, uh, first set of three questions. So as I, I said at the beginning, I will um, ask them in a group of three, and then I'll just come to each of the three of you to, to um, comment on them, uh, you know, in picking whichever of the questions uh, you'd like to respond to. Um, so the first, uh, so I'll give you three questions here. The first is from Kitesa de Lessa, who's a PhD student in Addis Ababa University. And the question is how we relate, um, uh, is around carbon tax and carbon emissions, um, uh, how effective that is for environmental sustainability, and related to uh, that, what are the key challenges Africa is facing, and what are the what are the solutions uh, that you would suggest, in, including research um, intervention? So, quite a high level question about where where are we in Africa in terms of uh, environmental sustainability? Is there a role for carbon tax? What are some of the key the key issues? The second is from Juan Ariel Jimenez, who's a lecturer in uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica. Madre e Maestra. And his question is, is there any country that could be seen as a role model for effective adaptation strategies? Um, Asan, you've already talked about Rwanda, might be useful to talk a bit more there, but there are other, uh, obviously lots and lots of, of innovation going on in India and elsewhere. Um, the third question is uh, from Ermias from Addis Ababa University. And the question is adaptations mechanisms um, for climate change are crucial uh, in agriculture, but the welfare impact is not obvious as farmers have to allocate much of their available time 
working on those projects rather than the farming activities. So what do research findings tell us about that, about the welfare, welfare impact of these adaptation strategies, taking into account the, the effects on, on farmers and the, and the resources required to, to um, around adaptation uh, as opposed to their, their farming. So a general sort of question around environmental sustainability in Africa, the role of the carbon tax and challenges Africa faces, a question about are there a good role model, is there a good country role model for effective more than one uh, adaptation strategies. And then the final question is, how do we think about the welfare impact of adaptation on farmers, given that uh, adaptation itself is costly in various ways? So let me um, come, uh, Vijaya, can I come first to you and then uh, Asan? Uh, and then... You know, something is coming to my mind is that uh, uh, it, 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 it's not adaptation strategies, but I would like to you know, say that Israel could be the one which is uh, uh, you know the, which is a country in terms of the uh, water utilization and and uh, uh, you know in spite of having no water not no water rather uh, uh, very less water in the country they have done very well in terms of the you know self sufficiency in in agriculture produce so i think that uh, you know looking at uh, the israel's contributions in terms of technology in this field we can definitely uh, you know take the technologies ahead and uh, we can learn from their uh, experiences in 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 water use if, in, in water use so uh, right now this is what is coming to my mind and at the same time i think brazil is also doing very well in terms of the adaptation so for the thank time you. being yes Great. thank you thank you um I forget who I said we <laughs> got next. Asan, do you want to pitch in? Uh, you're on mute. So any and, and, so to, um, add, and yeah. to add to it, government of India is doing actually many projects with the Israel uh, uh, for improving the agricultural productivity. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, I mean, Jonathan, and thanks a lot for the uh, audience for keeping us engaged with these really key questions. I mean, the issue of carbon and environmental sustainability is something, it's a huge topic in Africa. Uh, I'm trying to search in my mind for an example where carbon tax has been used effectively um, for adaptation or mitigation in the country. And I think I came across one case in Zimbabwe where there is a carbon tax on certain goods and services um, that the government collects, and they seem to ring fence it pretty well and uh, reinvest it within um, um, the activities of, uh, of development in the country. Now we know that Zimbabwe is facing a lot of challenges in terms of economic and social issues, and it's mere, but you know, it's a drop in the ocean. But I thought the model that they had put together of collecting carbon tax and reinvesting it in environmental issues was pretty awesome. Um, bearing in mind the situation that they've had in the last couple of years. Um, models for adaptation, I think there are very many across the continent. Um, but I think my key contribution towards this is that adaptation and development are really linked and we shouldn't look at it as something coming from somewhere very far. Um, that, that's not attainable. I think countries that have, have succeeded the most in, in, in adaptation are those that have invested heavily in their people. Um, I remember as a student of development learning what is development, you know, expanding people's choice, choices, ability to respond to their situation. I think that's really key in adaptation. So if we invest in our people's abilities to respond to the different situations, for them to have options for their livelihoods, that's a huge plus for adaptation. Uh, I'm not sure who has done that well, and I think there are various um, examples. Kenya is one that's doing a remarkable job in terms of you know, fixing its food systems, working around adaptation, conservation, agriculture, etc. And it all boils down to the quality or the people's lives, how they're able to accept and adopt some of these technologies. Um, the issue of welfare of adaptation, it takes time, it costs money, that's true. Um, but I think the cost of inaction is even worse. So we do recognize that. And um, I think we just still need to keep going and find the right balance between the two. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jonathan, just to add this uh, in, in the discussion on environmental tax, rather, I would uh, say that uh, it is the, the subsidies uh, which uh, sometimes become environmentally unfriendly subsidies in the agricultural sector. 
like like in case of uh, india fertilizer subsidy and water subsidy becoming environmentally unfriendly subsidies so i have not heard environmental tax as such but uh, subsidies uh, can uh, they are actually becoming uh, you know uh, causing uh, some kind of issues in the system thank you yeah um on on Kitesa's question on the carbon tax i think you know if you did a survey of economists i would be willing to bet that you know economists uh, policy intervention number 1 uh, for mitigation would be uh, a carbon tax um and so you know that's a i think a critical uh, thing which is going to be part of the the policy debate you know uh for, for a long time but you know, hopefully uh if, if we can get uh, progress on enacting these things i think you know the recent the most recent research uh, and even thinking of some research that some of my colleagues here have done has has shown that you know, some of the the off-sited negative economic impacts of a, of a carbon tax don't sort of match the data <laughs> and so uh that the idea that carbon taxes are going to harm employment uh, or hurt GDP that that hasn't really uh, uh, matched matched the data well, um, and so but I do think there's important research there to think about it distributional implications and, and so on uh, uh, to to be done on, on those policies. Uh, in terms of what I think is um, really you know, pressing issues for for Africa, um, you know the two that that come to mind immediately for me are you know, uh, water, uh, you know, irrigation. Uh, and uh, the Green Revolution. I mean, the, the Green Revolution, which, which we know about, has you know, uh, proliferated around many parts of the world, and many parts of Africa uh, were missed with that. And so, you know, seed varieties that are improved, um, but also climate resilient, <laughs> I think, are an opportunity for Africa uh, to have a, a, a wave of the Green Revolution that isn't just high yielding seeds, but high yielding seeds that are uh, you know, more tolerant to to these uh, weather extremes. We uh, just green, to just, green, just green, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, vagina. Uh, yeah, just to add to the discussion uh, on carbon tax, uh, and uh, you know, climate. This agricultural sector is definitely a victim as well as the agent of the climate change. So, so we we have been facing, uh, and we have been talking about uh, the victim side of it, but at the same time, the agent. Uh, is is also quite uh, you know the, uh, quite there that uh, agricultural sector actually contributes almost twenty to thirty percent of GHG's emission and causing climate change. So a time will definitely come when we will have to impose this carbon tax because what is going to happen? Other sectors are working hard to reduce their GHG's emission. So there, so the proportionate. Uh, you know, uh, the proportionate contribution of agricultural sector is then going to be much more higher. And then in that case, we will ha definitely have to control the situation through through carbon tax. Okay, Thank let's you. go on to the next set of uh, questions. Um, so the first of these um, comes from Pavitra Kumar uh, Jaina, who is at the School of Economics, Sri Mata Vaisho Devi University in Katra, India. And the question is, how is technology going to help agricultural adaptation to climate change in developing countries. The second question is from Tony Kukira, who's a PhD student at Oxford. And the question is for all speakers, I would like the speakers to speak a little bit more about resilience of farmers and farming communities. What does it really mean and how is it measured? Is it the ability of farmers to carry out farming or their ability to meet other needs, energy, education, and so forth? And then the third question is Rong Bao, who's an LSE alum and a current master's student at Yale. And the question is, could you comment on international organizations, especially the World Bank and the United Nations, current influences on local level adaptation initiatives? What are some potentials and challenges for future collaborations? So the first question is about the role of technology in agricultural adaptation. The second question is about resilience. What does it mean? And how do we define resilience both of farmers and farming communities and the third question is uh what are the role of international organizations in uh local level adaptation initiatives what are some of the potentials and challenges for those 
Asan, maybe I'd come first to you again, if that's okay. And then maybe I'll Kyle come to you and then to Vijaya. Yes, great. And thanks a lot for those questions. Um, yeah, really tough questions, but really relevant. And uh, let me just pick on the one on resilience and um, the role of international organizations. I think we all have been battling with the issue of resilience and how wide it is, how difficult it is to, um, to define, measure, track, and report on. Um, but I think what is key is for us to understand and define what shocks we're talking about. And in this case, if we maintain it with climate change, we would then say resilience, it will restrict it into the ability of farmers to be able to respond uh, to a shock and, and to some extent, you know, transform what they do into uh, a system that if future shocks do um, happen, um, they're able to, um, to respond to them or, or at least the, the, the impacts are less. Um, it's, it's, it's not an, a straight, straightforward um, answer to give in terms of what it is, you know, um, how do we measure it, how do we track it. We need to develop those indicators based on the situation we are faced with. Um, but the key thing is, uh, for the, it's, it's about the ability of this farmer or these farming communities to be able to one, either absorb um, the shocks and the, the, the disturbances in their system, adapt with particular practices, or indeed uh, take a completely different trajectory of building into something that's completely different. Um, and, and when we talk resilience, it's a combination of all of those. Um, I hope I've answered that uh, well in, in the shortest period of time, but I think it's a discussion we could have a whole topic, a webinar on. On international organizations, it takes particular interest to me um, because in, we've seen many times where you know, climate change agendas are decided for people in the developed, con developing countries. And because we, don't, we have limited research, we have limited influence on the table. Uh, what is key for us is um, that international organizations represent those institutions that don't have voices, those countries that don't have voice. So being objective, using the latest research uh, and sticking to the script uh, of adaptation, for example, uh, in Africa, that is what is key for us. And adaptation means food, uh, infrastructure, our ability to, to survive uh, in a situation of climate change that we contribute very little to. Um, so the role of international organizations is really key. The multilateral process is absolutely key. The question is, do, how, how do we maintain the principles and the foundations at which it was built for? Because it has been seen in the past to be manipulated as well. Uh, so I would still vote for them to, to, to be there, um, but let's be fair in terms of representation. Let's be fair in terms of the use of research from the global South and North, and based on their own priorities, advocate for solutions to be um, addressed. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Kyle. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just uh, add to that. I'm glad uh, Asan tackled the tough question about international organizations. I don't think I, I don't think I had a lot to add there. So I'm glad he did that so so well. I will second though the real importance of you know ha having these research projects uh, uh, grounded in what's happening uh, on the ground um, and, and sort of really understanding the the local context and designing interventions based on that um, rather than, than than the other way. Um, on the technology uh, adoption and technologies for adaptation, I think that, and this, this I think relates to the question about resilience or, or vulnerability as well. I think when we think about technologies for adaptation, the way I think of it is any, any instrument that makes a farmer's um, uh, production less sensitive to you know, uh, things that are impacted by climate change, whether that be more frequent floods, more frequent droughts, uh, hot temperatures, whatever, whatever that is. And so technologies or, or techniques that do that uh, serve as, as forms of adaptation, uh, you know, drought tolerance seeds, say, uh, water saving technologies, um, practices, uh, climate, climate friendly practices, such as, uh, uh, you know, um, straw incorporation or other things that keep soil moisture uh, sufficient throughout the season. These are all um, uh, innovations or, or, or techniques that are you know, types of adaptation um, that, that, that we think of. Um, in terms of resilience, um, when, when I think of that term, I really, I think more about 
variance <laughs> and, and reducing the, the, the variance, particularly in the left, the left tail, the extreme bad things happening to farmers and, and taking those out so that the farmer is less exposed to, to those. And so, uh, you know, keeping their, keeping their average wealth the same, if you will, <laughs> but taking those bad years and making sure their income during those, what previously used to be bad years is more like their income during the average year is a, a form of resilience. So I'm really thinking about, about variance in that, in that case. Thanks, Kyle. In which I, if I could ask you to be quite brief because yeah, we have another set of yeah, questions sure. that have come in. So. Sure, sure. Just, just to add to Asan and Kyle's point, uh, I think the, I mean, uh, for resilience, it is not just the resilience, but we need to increase the productivity of the sector at the same time, enhancing the resilience and uh, reduce the emissions. So I think this triple win of uh, climate smart agriculture is very important for, uh, for, 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 for the sector where, uh, you know, the agriculture is not uh, not just look at the you know at, at, at growing crops but at the same time it is uh, for the livestock it is for the fisheries and the forest everything and then you know the the emission which is taking place in the in the in the field that can be absorbed by, by the forest so it has to be uh, you know the, the complete package of of cropland forest uh, fisheries and 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 diversification of their incomes i think that is going to increase the resilience of the of the of the people uh, living in, on agricultural sector improving productivity in the sector at the same time you know it can reduce actually the com comprehensive climate smart agriculture can can reduce the emission as well Great. Thanks, John. so now we have the last uh, set of uh, questions um the first is from anika edun who's a lse student from nigeria and it's a question for all speakers. Given the current low productivity and inefficiencies in agriculture in many countries, which will be further worsened by climate change, what impact can the innovations and policies proposed truly have at scale? Given that Africa is a net food importer and current agricultural production, despite past investment in the sector, in the sector still remains insufficient to meet demand. The second question is from Atul Gobil, who's a concerned global citizen. The panel has shed light on diversification through non-farming sources to increase sustainability. Given the high impact of food system degradation, what can be done to increase farm employment and to increase its financial return of farm work? And then the final is from Praveen, who's a fellow scholar at NITIE in Mumbai. And the question there is, shall we consider contract farming as an adaptation strategy. So <clears throat> the first question is being realistic about the uh, situation in Africa with low productivity and inefficiencies, uh, which will be further worsened by climate change. What impact can innovations and policies proposed today really have at scale? The second is uh, on the uh, diversification through non-farming uh, sources to increase um, and uh, sustainability, given the high impact of food system degradation, what can be done to increase farm employment and its financial return? And then finally, what about contract farming as an adaptation strategy? So um, Kyle, can I come to you first and then to Asan and then to Vijay? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just be brief on a, cup, a couple of those. Uh, the, the question about the impacts at scale, um, and that's really, that's an important question that, that we need to, to think about, uh, and we need to take different tools uh, research-wise to, to think about some of those things and, and estimate those. So I agree that you know, the impacts at scale could be different from what we observe in you know, smaller, smaller scale uh, studies. That just goes to say that the research we do to really understand climate adaptation uh, needs to build in some of those uh, at scale uh, at scale effects. Um, so, Kyle, let me stop you there. We're we're quite short of time. We only have five minutes left, and I want to give each of you a chance to perfect. just you know, keep to keep perfect. points. So, um, uh, Asan, if you could just make one point uh, in response here, and Vijay, I'll ask you the same thing. Just one point in response to these this last set of questions. Thanks a lot. I think the one point I'd say is that contract farming is indeed a form of adaptation. And let's look at it from a market, market access rather than just singularly just contract farming. It's about giving access to um, farmers, market access to farmers, to, for them to be able to innovate, produce more based on demands from uh, their consumers, but also invest on their farms 
with climate smart agriculture and technologies that further increase their resilience. So indeed it is, but I would ask that we broaden it a little bit into market access. So contract farming is definitely an adaptation technique, technique but it should be looked at it from a, a point of view of access to markets. Thank you. Thanks. And Pujang. Yeah. Um, just to add to Asan's point, uh, you know, on contract farming with the with the businesses, I feel that it is it is not one to one basis. It cannot be one to one basis where forty to fifty percent of the population in in the agriculture in India or and in developing countries as well, large population. So I feel that it is if it can happen, say maybe village to uh, the the uh, particular business. So this kind of contract farming possibly can lead to adaptation in in this. Uh, you know, in this field. At the same time, I just want, I would like to add uh, to the point of policies. Yes, there are policies, uh, you know, like in India, National Mission for Sustainable Agriculture, in, which is actually one of the eight missions in, in India, and which focuses on dryland agriculture, because uh, almost 70% of the agriculture coming from the uh, dryland areas, and uh, focusing on risk management, access to information, and use of biotechnology. And there are, uh, you know, gamut of uh, uh, policy options are available on the same. Great, thanks very much, Thank Jaya. Yeah. Well, it's now time to uh, to wrap up. Um, I think what is striking for me about this panel and, and, and so useful in helping us all to think about adaptation more is uh, the importance you have all attached to thinking about adaptation at different levels. So to think about adaptation um, at the farm level and, and the, the role of technology and behavioral change to increase productivity, but also even broadening there, Jai, as you were saying, to think not just about, about crops, but about livestock, fisheries, and so forth. And then the next level up to think about non-farm uh, opportunities for work and how that's an important element of adaptation as well as things that happen on the farm. And then taking a level further up, how uh, both the role of migration and uh, rural urban, um, uh, both seasonal and permanent migration. And then even perhaps a level above that, which is making sure we don't lose track of the macro as well as the micro with the sectoral changes. So I think really you've helped us to get a really rich picture of the, the range of issues here. I wonder, we have just two minutes, so I wonder if you could each in, in sort of 15 seconds say what uh, you think are sort of key issues to be focusing on as we go forward thinking about adaptation. Um, and uh, Vijay, I'll start with you now and then Asan and then Kyle. Right. Uh, so I, I feel that, uh, you know, uh, uh, advancing this conversation on agricultural adaptation, more capital, more climate funds should flow from developing countries, sorry, developed countries to developing countries in need. Uh, and adoption of villages can be done from the business houses with some tax incentives if, it, if they are given and uh, more and more research on the effectiveness of the adaptation practices and more emphasis on the climate smart uh, agriculture, including livestock and uh, for forestry. So these are some of the points and cl climate smart technologies and management methods uh, can also be roped in uh, at the same time, early warning system and risk insurance and other innovations and that can promote resilience and combat climate change. Okay, great. Thanks very much. A little bit more than 15 seconds. Asan, could you keep your remarks <laughs> short so we can finish? Well, yeah, thanks a lot, Jonathan. And I think for me, it's really a, an issue of uh, adaptation being people focused. Um, and that being you said, moving away from issues of agriculture, but to more food systems as an integrated approach. And the second thing that's really important to me is attaching the urgency towards uh, issues of adaptation in Africa. The urgency is real. It's a felt need. It's something we need to do now because the costs of not doing it are actually bigger than you know what they are today. Thank you. Right, Kyle. Just really quickly, I'll just uh, say that this is a critical issue and. Really, I would like to see us try even harder to understand the barriers to adaptation and what those barriers are. Some cases, the technology might be there. Other cases, it's there. And we just need more research to really understand what barriers are preventing uh, that uptake and trying to unlock, uh, unlock those. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Kyle. Thanks, Vijaya San, for a really very rich uh, discussion around these important issues. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of our attendees. Thank you very much for joining us. I know you've joined us from all over the world, and it's and, uh, really great to have this kind of interaction and, 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 and uh, active discussion around these issues. Um, could I just remind you, there will be a brief survey uh, that you'll be getting uh, as, as we close now the seminar. Really helpful for us to understand how to make these events better in the future. So please do take the time 
time to respond to that. Thank you all very much. Thanks to the panelists and thanks to all the attendees. Thank you very much.